afternoon, and thank you for joining the inaugural From Paws to Claws Alumni Speakers Visionary 2020 series. If this is your first time joining us, we welcome you. If you are returning, welcome back. We are glad that you are present to receive information from this week's engaging panelists. Your Office of Alumni Relations appreciates each of you. We will continue to bring you remarkable alumni as experts in their specific fields. They will expound on relevant topics that, they, that will support our students, recent graduates, as well as alumni who are seeking career change. And we are grateful to each individual who wishes to provide support to this series. As always, we wish to thank the alumni panelists for today and those who have participated in the last five months. We did not seek you out, yet you came with the spirit of a mighty panther, which we are, sharing your knowledge base when the call to participate went forth. This is our newest series of From Paws to Claws, and we are still dedicating it to the perfect vision class of 2020 as they exercise their ability to be visionaries. Let me share a tad bit of history on the Office of Alumni Relations signature event. The Alumni Student Networking event titled From Paws to Claws was originally designed in 2008 when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010, in his sophomore year expressed the need for students to engage and learn from this one exceptional university. Over the years, we continuously call on the alumni community to embrace our alumni in waiting, commonly known as students. We encircle them until they become a member of our alma mater. As Panther clubs, they develop their discovery academically, socially, and spiritually, finding their way as their paws grow claws while becoming fully entrenched felines of service, locally, nationally, and globally, and remembering to provide financial support to the institution that placed them on their paths of well-rounded citizens. There is so much more to the program and feel free to read the entire historical review in the alumni section on the CAU website. As we begin our exchange, I would like to express thanks to my colleague, Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as the program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host, for she created this space of interaction. Chastity, it is now time for you to begin the dialogue. Thank you so much, alumna Galen Igekwa Chasho, for that treasured introduction and credible context. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the Vision 2020 series. When you reach the top, remember to send the elevator back down for others, part three. An exceptional thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education for being the technical guru behind all of OER's webinars. We truly appreciate your help. The purpose for today's webinar is to discuss how to become a true leader. There is a phrase in the entrepreneurial world called paying it forward. The notion that all of us who have had some degree of success will likely have had individuals give us that break. They believed in us when we had not yet earned such trust and from whom opportunities came that have helped create our success. The credo is simply this, when you get to the top of your ladder, a success, help someone else pay it forward. Or when you get to the top floor, don't forget to send the elevator back down for someone else. Join us as we discuss one of the most important things to do in our careers. Help others dreams become a reality. It's a privilege and an obligation to support others in achieving their desired success. The newest arrivals will appreciate it, and you'll leave the world better than you found it. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. 
If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A panel and our Zoom control panel. I will bring them up to you all during our Q&A section to discuss. Now, without further ado, introducing our first panelist for this afternoon is alumnus Al B. Reed. Alumnus Reed is a Vice President of Global Citizenship at Abbott Laboratories. In this role, he has global responsibility for managing key stakeholder relationships and engagements related to corporate social responsibility programs and initiatives. Alumnus Reed previously served as a Vice President of Corporate Development with responsibility of evaluating and executing key new growth opportunities through partnerships, strategic alliances, and accusations. In other roles at Abbott, Alumnus Reed has led corporate strategy and business analytics groups that helped clients implement all aspects of their business strategies, operations, and product portfolio needs. Before joining Abbott, Alumnus Reed was the Vice President of Strategy and Development at Baxter Healthcare with global responsibility for strategy development, capability enhancement, and financial growth. Previously, Alumnus Reed also held positions of increasing responsibility at Dunn and Bradstreet, Paramount Co Communications, and the Federal Reserve Bank in M&A Finance, Treasury, and Management Counseling. Alumnus Reed completed his BA in Communications at Clark College in 1983 and his MS in Management at Carnegie Mellon University. His honors include UNC of Outstanding Alumnus Award, Chicago United Business Leaders of Color, and the, Tom the Thomas W. Cole Jr. Legacy Award. Alumnus Reed serves on the boards of CAU as a trustee, the History Makers, CAU Golf District Association Board of Governors, and the Advocates Pro Golf Association. He is also a member of the Executive Leadership Council. Alumnus Reed and his wife, Sherry, Clark College class in 1985, live in Northbrook, Illinois, and have two adult children. Welcome, Alumnus Reed or Trustee Reed. How are you doing today? Well, thank you very much, Chastity, for that uh, introduction. Um, all is well here in Chicago. It's time to pull out our hats and gloves. So it's a little chilly, unlike uh, the summer <laughs> that you're experiencing in, in the Atlanta area. But thank oh, you. Yeah. No problem. And thank you always for continuing to support your alma mater. We truly appreciate you. So we're going to go ahead and dive into your first question for this afternoon. Towards the end of the Amazon entrepreneurial uh, session this past month, a concerned voice in the audience asked, how do those over 30 years stay relevant? In a world where digital natives increasingly have an upper hand, this was a fair question and one which many senior leaders likely worry about. As the DVP of Corporate Development at Abbott Laboratories in Illinois, do you sense that we should develop a growth mindset embrace what we don't know and seek out a reverse mentorship opportunity, build transferable skills, or don't work for a traditional company. If you do, get out and find a brand who incorporates the values you have. What's your opinions on this? Well, uh, thank you for the question. But first of all, you know, Tiffany, I think it's important that we all must understand our past, our present, and the future uh, mm -hmm. as part of our career uh, continuous arc. And by that, I mean, what will make, there will be different things that will make us successful at each junction. Uh, so therefore it's kind of critical that we pay attention uh, and respond to some of the societal changes that we're all witnessing in front of us. You know, for example, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has caused a great amount of disruption in the marketplace, as well as with overall business dynamics. And so as a result, we've all been forced to become shrewder adopters of technology, whether they are to, uh, Zoom or TikTok or, uh, or, or other things. But I think by embracing these various technological platforms, we've all uh, have to make certain that we lose our ability to, we haven't lost our ability, uh, I might say, to fulfill some of our professional responsibilities 
be it engaging with our business clients and family, ordering food, toiletries, or clothing, all in ways that we really didn't think about in the past. And so as a result, what it means is this translates into developing a global mindset, meaning that we all have to seek to become uh, more thoughtful leaders in the fields that we chose, uh, learn to improvise and innovate on our core strengths, and then more importantly, seek partnerships and perspectives from outside of our various groups. Uh, because at the end of the day, we, uh, it's, in, it's imperative that we remain true to our core values. Uh, and, 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 and by saying that, you know, historically as people of color, you know, the things that have gotten us from where we are, where we are today have been, you know, our fortitude and our faith. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I wholeheartedly agree on that. So an interesting discussion uh, point between the Coca-Cola brand, company brand, Refresh Team, centered on how the environment impacts the outcome. Uh, for example, having an experienced C-suite team meet with a group of senior customers will lead to a predictable outcome. So granted, that outcome can be a great one, but put a razor sharp, young and inexperienced rising star from the business in the room and the conversation is likely to be different as the stimulus has changed. What would you change about how you approach meetings, hybrid lifestyles and global careers? Well, I think regardless of where you are in your career, we must remember the five Ps and, and I think we've heard them before you know, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So there is no substitute for being ready when the spotlight is shining on you. So as future global leaders, it's critical that we stay abreast of the changing customer needs. You know, a uh, CEO of a global PR firm said that customers are human beings. So when human beings evolve, you have to evolve with them. So mm -hmm. hence, I think in everything we do, we must be able to adapt to changes occurring around us you know, we have to pursue our aspirations over anxieties. You know, we, 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 we all become very vulnerable when we rest on our laurels. You know, no one cares about what you did in the past, but we also must not, uh, we must avoid trying to constantly reinvent ourselves because at the end of the day, relevance means being relentless about innovating on your core strategies. So, you know, as companies, uh, have globalized and automated over the past decades. The competition for talent is particularly in the STEM and business analytic fields. It is imperative that you know, all of our students and alumni focus on creating outstanding performance through their individual thought leadership. So you know, we talked about making certain that we remain current uh, within our industry. You know, we have to make it necessary, uh, continue to uh, have the necessary, receive the necessary training uh, and, and then not be afraid to seek out high profile projects, because this is the way, you know, you uh, will ensure that you get the visibility uh, that's mm -hmm. necessary. And then finally, you know, regardless of where you are, what you're doing, we have to deliver, you know, tangible results that are important to the company's top and bottom line. So we have to constantly ask ourselves each and every day, is what I'm doing, is it relevant to the overall success? Uh, of the company or the of the business that I'm, I'm currently running. I love that. So tangible results, is it relevant? Creating outstanding performance in leadership, understanding the five Ps and improving and adapting to the current changes around us. So those are some really good points that I feel like not only myself, but our attendees could definitely take back today and, you know, understand, especially in this hybrid relationship that we're undergoing now, because it's a new normal for all of us, you know, yes. not just people that have been in leadership for 20 plus years, 30, 40, you know, it's even people that's been in leadership for five, you know, or two or just starting out. So everything is new. So it's like we all kind of have a clean slate to where we can evolve and execute together. So. Thank you so much for that, Alumnus Reed. We really appreciate that. If you all have any questions for Alumnus Reed, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, Alumnus Reed. We really appreciate you. Please stay warm up there, okay? Because it's still kind of warm down here. <laughs> Introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is Alumna Shalana Melton. Alumna Melton is a senior product um, adoption expert at McKinsey. 
She has a proven track record as a creative, inspiring, and forward-thinking leader. She guides cross-functional teams to create customer-centric products and services that serve their clients' needs in unique ways. Alumna Melton is responsible for driving overall product adoption and impactful insights-based content that address customer pain points with product value creativity. Before joining McKinsey in 2019, alumna Melton held a number of positions at American Express. She developed comprehensive marketing strategies and executed plans that drove company revenue, built brand equity, and created loyal customers. Alumna Melton began her career in marketing and sales in the telecommunications industry in Atlanta. Alumna Melton is a customer-centric and innovative marketer who has consistently delivered results by crafting compelling strategic visions and networking, building capabilities and driving execution. She is a passionate leader who, drives, who, who thrives on building, developing and nurturing future leaders. Alumna Melton holds a BA of Arts and Marketing and Management and an MBA in marketing from Clark Atlanta University. Alumna Melton is an avid fitness fanatic and yoga instructor residing in Newark, New Jersey with her boxer, Max. How are you doing today, Alumna Melton? Thank you so much for always serving your alma mater. Thank you, I am doing well. Thank you for the pleasure of being here today. No problem, no problem at all. Please give our love to Max as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're going to go ahead and, and um, dive into your first question for this afternoon. Cool? Sounds great. All right. One of the most valuable behaviors for the C-suite today is forward economic thinking. As someone who drives overall product adoption and insights-based content, how do we utilize product value creativity towards our customers? One of the first most important things is understanding for a brand who you are and what you what you bring what is the value that you bring to your end customers um, one of the most important things also is to understand who your end customers are and where they are along their user journey whether they're new customers whether they're customers you're trying to bring back or whether you're trying to drive loyalty with those customers but understanding who they are and what they bring whether they're the single mom, whether they're a family of four, whether they're a male who's aged 45 years old, it's best to understand who they are and what their needs are. You can't be a brand today um, and, and think that you're going to be stacking it and think that your product is going to resonate if you haven't changed and you haven't driven any innovation in the past year and a half. You have to understand your product has to adapt and it has to change and it has to grow um, in order to meet your customer's needs. For example, if we go to the grocery store, we understand that we may see Special K on the top row, we may see Captain Crunch on the bottom row, but just know that there was a thought and that there's a strategy to that um, mm -hmm. for those kids who want those sugary cereals, they put them on the bottom row because they know those kids are going to grab those when they go to the grocery store. Um, so understanding that creativity and innovation comes from diversified thought. Um, when you have that diversity sitting in those conference rooms, making those decisions um, in those meetings, but they have to come. You have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to prototype your product, knowing that it may not be perfect when you go to market, such as the latest iPhone, but you know that updates are going to come out every couple of months because they want to get something out to market, but knowing that those updates are coming later. Creativity comes from, again, diversified thought, knowing those end user and being able to, and being flexible enough to pivot when it's necessary. Um, alumna Reeve kind of mentioned being able to have that ability to flex and innovate and, and kind of make that drive um, and not being afraid to do that because so you can't be stalemate, you think everything is gonna work. That, that's been stable for the past five to 10 years. We're living in an ever changing, ever evolving environment. So you have to be able not, you have to be able to step outside your comfort zone as a firm and as a brand to do so, to meet those customers' needs. So firms are risking heavy losses or even extinction if they do not bring in experienced hands, skilled at fast paced change. As a self-described transformer, why do you think this is so? And what is the solution behind the situation? You have to have as a firm diversified thought. Um, and one of the things I've experienced is sometimes firms recruit from the same staple Ivy League schools. 
and recruiting from the same schools, you have the same, sometimes the same mindset. So having that diversified thought in place um, can prevent them companies from being stalemate or prevent them from going extinct. If you're if you're afraid that your product, let's say you have pickles, for example, um, and you have this staple pickle that's going to, that's been in the market for the past 15 years, and you're still selling the same thing, but in the environment we live in now, maybe pickles have to be diversified. Maybe you're adding different flavors. Maybe you're marketing it differently. Um, you're adding different packaging. You're uh, providing e-commerce opportunities. So you have to be able to be flexible depending on the current marketplace, which is going on, and then the customer, the end customer that you're trying to reach. Um, as we see with generations change, you have the millennials, gener generation X, generation Y, the baby boomers, and each one of them have different needs. So as a company, in order to be able to continue to thrive, you have to be able to have the person maybe come from a liberal arts school, one who comes from an HBCU, maybe someone who doesn't have a degree, but has a plethora of experience in those rooms, making those decisions. And we as African-Americans have to be able to stand up, even if we are the only black and brown person sitting in the room, say, I, you know, that's a great idea, but have you thought about this? Or I don't agree with this. Being able to flex and stand up and give our opinions when something is not right, when, especially when they're trying to target African-Americans when there are no African-Americans in the room except for us. Got it, got it. So be, being sure to um, be flexible at all times and all about driving innovation, pivoting when necessary and understanding who you are and what you're bringing to the table, at least what your customers are, you know, who your customers are and what their needs are. So those are some really helpful tips that definitely take away from alumna Melton. If you all are on the call today to definitely understand especially in her area of C-suite. So thank you so much, alumna Melton. We truly appreciate the essential tips today and the materials. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. If you all have any questions for alumna Melton, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, alumna Melton. Introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is alumnus Ted Jackson. Alumnus Jackson is a senior operations executive who has developed and led successful value creative strategies for a broad range of public and privately held companies for over a 20 year period. Extensive involvement in leading performance improvement programs to achieve dramatic improvements in margin growth, cash flow and shareholder value through a variety of property pricing, working capital, supply chain strategy, manufacturing pr productivity and distribution programs across the US, Canada, Mexico, Europe and Asia. Alumnus Jackson has is a transformational leader that who leads and finds strategic solutions to operationally complex situations requiring creative cross-functional team building, organizational leadership, and data-driven focused execution. Woo, that is a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alumnus Jackson, for joining us today. And we truly appreciate you for always serving your alma mater and for always giving us a shout out on LinkedIn. We truly appreciate you for everything. <laughs> How are you doing today? Where the Alumnus Jackson? Uh, where can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Great. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate no, the opportunity. No problem. We thank you for accepting the opportunity. We're going to go ahead and dive into your first question for this afternoon. Um, research from the likes of BAN publications has pointed to internal dysfunction, not lack of opportunity or unmatchable competitor capabilities as the main barrier to continued profitable growth. C suites must change and address dysfunction head on if they are to grow. Being at Novalex for five years as an operations executive and now as a senior operations executive, executive, do you agree with this statement and why or why not? Overall, I do agree with that, but there's a couple of key caveats. I think that, you know, as we think about the world that we live in today, the lack of opportunity from a market perspective, uh, differentiated, more nimble competition, 
and competitor capabilities are definitely definitely barriers to profitable profitable growth. Um, you know, I, I just think back to some of the comments that Al made about improvisation and innovation and, and Solana about, you know, being able to pivot, right? In the COVID world that we live in today, entire markets are either gone or have shifted. And so the lack of opportunity is real as we think about paths to profitable, profitable growth. But, you know, many companies are repositioning themselves in creative ways to stay alive and to even thrive. You know, several businesses are growing faster than their competitors because they have been able to pivot and adapt to the new environment. And I see several of these examples, particularly around the food service industry and things that we do relative to our consumption patterns. Um, but these are core strategic external issues that always require focus. I would say the internal dysfunction piece is a formula for lack of performance, even for companies that are doing well. And usually the path to dysfunction starts with a lack of effective teamwork Mm -hmm. and is the type of issue in a cancer that can go quick, quickly. And so, you know, at the core, this is company culture that we're talking about. And some of this, some of the factors may be style and personality driven. Some may be just a natural friction between different departments whose metrics may conflict. They re require some realignment. But company culture always evolves. Priorities change, people change. But as internal disconnects are discovered, I've always found it effective to address the issue head on in an open, honest, and, trans and transparent way and in an honest way to bring people to the table for just direct, honest, sometimes tough discussion. But we usually come out of the other side with an increased level of self-awareness and alignment. You know, so for example, as a leader, I, I approach these situations with the goal of figuring out how to talk to my team or cross-functional team members in a way that in, you know, three or four weeks or in a month or two, you know, they're going to pick up the phone and call me to thank me because they feel like they're in a job and a work environment where they can succeed and we're more effective. And a lot of this centers around feedback and giving people feedback is good and the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I've always taken the perspective that you're not being fair to that individual or team if you're not giving them feedback on an ongoing basis. And most people early in their careers tend to want to be everybody's friend. And they may be hesitant about having tough conversations and addressing issues. And this, these are the types of things that lead down the path of internal dysfunction. And the right people for your business culture will appreciate you being straightforward and direct with them so that they can improve and be more effective as a team. You know, and my personal challenge is, you know, how do I continue to do this? How do I continue to sustain the excitement, the commitment and the energy um, leading in an environment that's so different than where we were just nine months ago? You know, I'm accustomed to spending time with my team traveling and been in front of in front of people and 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 really having a lot of uh, interaction in person with my leadership team and we're doing a lot of that virtually now so it's a new normal that we're all adapting to but you know the approach and the in the spirit of addressing head issues head on to to head off that internal dysfunction is still the same the same awesome okay well we're beginning to see c level executives who have uh, more in common with the executive peers than they do with the people and the functions they run how important is it for members of senior management to not only support the ceo on business strategies but also to offer their own insights and contribute um, to key decisions in other words understand how to operate their position as well how important is it for C-level uh, executives to not only understand their position, but to understand how other positions run and function as well? Yeah, I, I think that this is a critical skill set. And one of the comments earlier was diversity of thought. And so this is a critical skill gap for executives and business leaders that don't understand how other positions and departments around them function. You know, in, in some regards, this could be called, you know, siloed mentality or just the, the impact of, of, of a lack of diversity. But it, it all comes down to is that we have different teams or different team members in the same business that either are not aware or purposely don't share valuable information with other members of the company. And what ends up happening is that this hurts the unified vision of the business and defers long-term goals and value creation from being accomplished. 
right? And lack of value creation usually become comes from unnecessarily unnecessary misaligned or duplicated work, all of which prevents agility, adaptability, being able to pivot. And in this world and, and how rapidly markets are changing and so forth, that's extremely critical. And so having a slow organization, um, you know, just results in poor decision making because you don't have the, uh, the total picture and it's just very, very risky. So for my view, siloed models of leadership, kind of top down, transactional, lack of diversified thought, they don't really truly leverage the full perspective of the company and the resources working as a team, it, it will just really prove to be very, very inadequate to meet the pace of change in today's COVID world. You know, as I mentioned, we're, we're in an entirely different world than in Q1. And the, the challenge is that the pace of change in the world will continue to accelerate. And, you know, for example, at Novalex, you know, we, we really focused on breaking down silos, increasing cross-functional communications, and from a culture standpoint, we've done this a few ways. Obviously, you know, putting people first. How do we manage our marketplace? How do we make sure that we're servicing demand as an essential business, that we're planning the right products, aligning our human capital, manufacturing capacity, and supply chain when we aren't really sure of what's next, right? There's no way to do that without a cross-functional perspective, right? And then as we think about navigating that path, what parts of our strategy do we pause? You know, what parts do we continue to invest in knowing that we're in an uneven situation, right? So making the best decision, you know, requires some inclusivity and diversity of thought amongst all teams and leadership that understands and facilitates, you know, this sort of cross-functional planning and execution will be more successful. I mean, there's always more to work to do here. Um, but, you know, one of the one of the best pieces of career advice that I received to help, you know, kind of have you know, force me to think more broadly. It's just to think like an owner or a CEO, because mm -hmm. when you view the business, the business from that perspective, you really force yourself to understand the entire machine and the big picture, and really, you know, think across various silos or uh, specific functions. I like that. So definitely thinking like an owner or a CA CEO to understand the entire machine, um, having diversity of thought aligning human capital, and always, um, it's all about repositioning ourselves to pivot and to thrive in order to stay afloat. So very important gems taken back for um, alumnus Jackson, for our attendees, it definitely, definitely um, take some of these points down, you know, in order to thrive and survive in this new normal. Thank you so much, alumnus Jackson, for the best yeah. practice and for um, the awareness that you have instilled in us today. We totally appreciate it. So Thank you. You're welcome. If you all have any questions uh, for alumnus Jackson, please type them into our Q&A box in our Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. So now moving on to our last but never least final panelists for this afternoon, alumnus Kareem Arcade. Alumnus Cade is a native Detroiter and a 1994 graduate of Clark Atlanta University with a bachelor's degree in business administration, focusing on insurance and risk management. Alumnus Cade launched Great Lakes Benefit Group, GLBG, in 2006 to address the growing demand of a one-stop shop approach for small to mid-sized employer groups. GLBG currently provides benefits consulting for K-12, traditional public and charter school districts, public-private sector associations, and national union or organizations in Michigan, Maryland, Georgia, Washington, D.C., and Florida. In addition to his business interests, alumnus Cade is a graduate of Leadership Oakland, and has held several leadership positions in community organizations. Selective Service System, Detroit uh, Metro Detroit Association of Health Underwriters, National Association of Black School Educators, National Technical Honor Society, Honorary Member, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Michigan, Board Member, and the Ron Clark Academy Board Member. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, alumnus Kate. How are you doing today? 
if my mama could see me now. Oh my God, look at this. I made it, mama. <laughs> Oh, well, Chas, y'all doing very well. Thank you for having me. And I'm just excited to be on the panel with this esteemed guest here. I'm, I'm excited. I'm fired up. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, look, that's the energy we need, especially to close it out now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to uh, dive into your first question for this afternoon. Okay. So it's all about inspirational leaders, which we kind of see right now, you know, amongst all of you all. The premise of the CEO has changed. The job is no longer focused on reporting to shareholders. Having the ability to inspire the team is an equal priority. This isn't down to skills. It's about having a clear leadership vision, solid values, and behaviors which demonstrate expectations to others. As someone who is a part of several boards and the founder of the Great Lakes Benefit Group, do you sense that if a corporation, organization, or person chooses to create a challenger brand culture, must first demonstrate that they are willing to challenge their own thinking? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. And so uh, I have a motto in my office that simply says that I'm uncomfortable being comfortable, right? And so anytime that I find myself getting comfortable, I know that I'm behind the eight ball. I can recall when starting the business uh, that uh, uh, my grandfather early on told me, you know what, while you're sleeping, everyone else is thinking. And so you've got to constantly be evolving. And so when I look at uh, CEOs and leaders that are in that space, uh, I never wanted to be painted into a box. First of all, as an African-American business owner, specifically in the area of risk management of insurance, guess what? There's just not anybody like me in the room. I'm always the only one in the room having that conversation, having to defend uh, uh, why I'm in the room. And so because of that, I make sure that my vision is always looking outside of the box. You can't ever paint me. So I've always been the kid that never colored inside the lines, right? And so I had to, I tell people all the time that I had to be an entrepreneur because I don't know that I would follow rules well. And so because that is the issue, I think for me, it's always been about how are we outthinking our competition? What are they doing? How can we do something different than what, what they're doing? But more importantly, how do I still do it in my same vernacular? For so long, I spent time with the, the code switching and trying to fit in and assimilate to what people were doing in their own organizations. And I finally had to realize that, you know what? I embrace what Clark Atlanta gave to me. I embrace who I am as an African-American man. And I'm going to step up to the table and say, I do see it differently than you do. And I love, I think Alumna Melton said, you know, you can't talk about you're going to market to black folks and then you don't have anybody at the table that looks like us. So exactly. I think when we start talking about those types of things, I'm so passionate about the, when I saw this topic of sending the elevator down, I've always been riding on the elevator and sending it back down, right? I've been riding on it since the folks in, in Clark. It's probably some of them on the line right now. Dr. <laughs> Brody, LaQuinta J Jacob spoke for you before. I have four yeah. sisters that helped me ride the elevator up to finish out Clark because I was partying the entire time. So I fully embody, find a way or make one. I had to make one because nobody was offering me anything. So when you come with that kind of grit, when you come with that type of motivation from the beginning, you're always having to evolve and never stay stagnant was there. I remember, Chastity, that I had someone tell me years ago that the A students teach the B students how to work for the C students. And so I've been a C student all my damn life, right? And so I had to always be around smart people. I had to be around people who would challenge my thinking. I had to be around people that would give me different vantage points. And so that has allowed us to continue to grow the business to the locations that we're in today. And we started this out from scratch. I started out, I didn't have a rich uncle. I didn't have great parents that gave me a bunch of money. I started and just continued to reinvest and reinvest more dollars. And every dollar we got, we put it back into the business. I didn't have a business loan. I didn't have any of those other things as a business owner. So it's always been based upon, we've got to go out and think differently about how we approach this. And my team understands that there is nothing that I don't ask them to do that I'm not willing to do. So I'm on the front line all of the time with whatever has to happen. And when you're a small business owner, everybody thinks it's glamorous. And I can tell you what, it looks glamorous, but I'm always reminding folks that I'm like the duck on the top of the water. It looks real smooth, but my feet up under there, just going. <laughs> like, happening the whole time. I make it look real smooth, though. I make it look real smooth. But behind the scenes, we're trying to figure out all the pieces because I don't have a large organization behind me. I am the organization. And so my final thought on that, on that question that you asked is that we realize, I, I, I joke with my guys and say, we're like this little Smurf fan. So in our office, there's 10 of us, right? Mm -hmm. But we looked at business models that were very effective in that. And we had to make sure that everybody was in their places 
in order to make that work. Jim Collins, good to great, right? You gotta be in the right place on the bus, right? And, and putting people in the right position. And so from thinking about looking at the culture, thinking about looking at vision, I had to always stay in front of them and bring them back to that. And obviously in COVID, you had to do the exact same thing. And so I think that the important piece for CEOs is that if you're not looking at that vision and constantly changing and you get comfortable, the competition is on your heels and they're looking to take you out. And for us, our competition are all the larger houses, the Aons, the Willis's, all of these large companies that can bury us at any point in time. So we've got to be great in order to be superior and fight against those guys. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree on that. And I can say you all are doing an amazing job and you have an awesome team. I mean, I promise you, I, don't spoke, to, I spoke to one of your team members, Ms. Hawkins, I believe, every single day. And we are always uh, end up talking about something else because <laughs> she's an awesome person. She's, she's a great it's a dream. You got to make it all work. It's business dream. Exactly. Yeah. And you definitely, you need people like that to, you know, to yes. keep the engine running, you know, yes. so. Thank Absolutely. goodness that you have people behind you that are there to support you. So, yes. and, and we're there to rooting you Absolutely. on. Absolutely. So flourishing the, the C-suite executives build collaborative um, interdepartmental teams that achieve goals without vying for credit and praise. How do you inspire your cross-functional teams to meet their objectives while providing opportunities for individualized growth? Well, I'll tell you, Chas, that's, that's a phenomenal question. And so we adopted a principle, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, the Northern Bank Fighting Irish team. And so they have a, a policy that they don't put anybody's name on the back of a jersey in football, right? And the yep. concept is that it's all one team. And so even when you get a business card from me today, it does not say CEO, it does not say founder. My card is just like the rest of my team's card because at the end of the day, it's all one team. I found out early on when I put CEO on my card, that just means I write all the damn checks, right? That's it. At the end of the day, somebody's going to contact me to write a check somewhere. But when I can walk into the room and I'm not concerned about do they feel like I'm the CEO, from a cross-functional standpoint, everybody has to learn. When you're a smaller organization, you don't have an opportunity. I heard some others talking about silos and things. We don't have that. We're small. So everybody has to know what everybody's job is because if one person catch cold, we've got pneumonia as an organization. And so we cannot have that, right? So before us, we have to make sure that everybody understands each piece of what goes on in the organization. I don't expect you to do my role 100%, but part of that is that when you come into our organization, I'm telling you up front, this is what we expect of you. Everybody plays like a CEO. You every, And I think the last brother, Ted, said that every, you got to think like a CEO. If you're going to sit in this seat, you've got to think like, what are we thinking about this? It can't just be about me. And then your other question, you talked about our shareholders. Well, although we're not a public company, our shareholders are different. Our shareholders are our clients, our staff. And those people become very important. So in order for that to happen, everybody has to know what the other person is doing. I've got to be able to think like my analyst guy, and I'm not an analyst, right? But i got to know what is he thinking about when we're looking at these numbers. I've got to think like my marketing guy because he's a glue guy. He's, he's making sure the relationship is great. That's great. I've got to think you're telling me about Michelle right now. I've got to think about Michelle. Michelle is, uh, she's the face. You don't deal with me. You're talking to Michelle on the phone. She's the first person that comes aboard. So I've got to have everybody trained up on what needs to happen such that we can flow functionally. And so when you talk about that, I find CEOs that are afraid to look at you know, other folks for that. I'm looking for the smartest people. I was always told if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I mean, that's just it. If I'm in the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. And so I need to elevate and level up and change where I am in that position. So my folks know that I expect you because of that, we pay you well, but more importantly, I expect you to think like that, right? And if you can't think like that, because our team is so small, then we can't have you here. So it becomes more of the movie 300, right? We don't need everybody. We just need 300 of the best. In my case, I need the best 10 folks to work with me and make it work. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, Chastity, of the book that keeps me in line. And so people always share their books and the books that keep yeah. me in line. And I'm going to show you the book that keeps me in line. This is the book that keeps ah! me in line. Okay. Stop. And, and so, and so, and so why do I say that, right? Because people look at it, you're looking for something spectacular. And what yes. happens in this book is that he continues to change the vantage point to say, hey, look at it from a different place, right? And so for me, as a business owner and thinking about my end user clients, 
if I only offer to, to them in this one way, I've got to think about 20 or 30 other ways that might meet their needs. And I think the alumni Melton was talking about, I got to look at those, what are the demographics of the folks out? Is it a 45 year old? Is that? And so I can't just offer it the same way on a regular basis. So this book, as funny as it is, it guides the principles of what we do in our office is that we've got to ask for it a different way. We've got to think about it a different way. And we've got to give new information to our clients such that they can make a new decision. Because just because they said no the first time doesn't mean forever. What we're saying is that we've got to give them more information to look at it differently such that they'll choose us. And so this book, guys, as funny as it is, and I like this got big pictures in here, right? You know, more importantly, <laughs> it's the thought process, right? It's the thought process that you cannot stop. We cannot sit back and just simply say, oh, I asked one time and this was the only way. And I think, again, Alumnus Reed said that. I mean, you've got to be thinking about that. So when I'm thinking about all the silos, there were a hundred different silos in here, different places that he could have got stuck. But what he said was like, hey, have you tried it like this, though? Well, would, you, would you try it if we were in this position? Would you try it if you think about that way? And I think as a leader, we've got to constantly be thinking about, I can't only think about the way that I would enjoy this. How will other people enjoy this? What will get them to do business with us? And this book always keeps us on track in our office. Oh, Dr. Seuss, literally. Dr. One of the Seuss, best. it's simple. We make what? things so tough and so hard. It's simple. It it's is. simple. <laughs> Another good book from Dr. Seuss, All the Places You'll Go. All the Places that, You'll Go. Absolutely. Oh my God. When I tell you whoever wrote that is the best brand marketer ever. My you goodness. Simple. You got to keep it simple. But like yeah. you said, you got to keep asking it in different ways. I mean, right. you know, like I said, if you can't get in the door, go through the window. If they don't have a window, then make yourself a doggy paddle. You know, like, just go whichever way. You got to get exactly. it. Find, find so, a way to make one. Find a way to make exactly. one. Exactly. So some key takeaways from you. Um, do not get too comfortable. And while you're sleeping, everyone is always up thinking. I know that because I'm one of those people, the vampire. <laughs> and how are we out, you know, how are we to outthink our competition, you know? And I really would say that one great thing about working for this university is I really feel like this year, during this new normal, we really truly outthought our competition, which is one of the reasons how we are staying afloat, how we um how we're continuing to keep our students healthy, how we are not in um the news for any type of bad press or bad PR, you know, news because you know if some of our students get COVID because they want to party on campus, it's going to be a PR it's night. Everywhere. So I applaud our administration for definitely, you know, instilling what was to occur over these years and taking and taking it back. And also, you know, if you have to think like a CA, um, a CEO, it can't just be about you. You know, you have to have the functions of different other of your um your team in order to understand what they're doing in order to move forward. So it's all about your brand at the end of the day. So Absolutely. once you know that, you know, build your brand. So thank you so much. Thank you. You know, you just you just stole my heart when you when you showed me the Dr. Seuss because anybody <laughs> who to, they know that I am a Dr. Seuss. I I have every book. I'm not even going to <laughs> If you all have any questions for alumni, uh, Alumnus K, please type them into our Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we will be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, Alumnus K. Thank you. No problem. So thank you once again to our alumni panelists for the insightful gems that have been released today to go forth with you all. We will go ahead and take some time now for our questions. Just a reminder, please be sure to type them into um, our control panel now. Uh, now is the time to definitely engage with our alumni and to network. So it looks like we have a few questions. Let's take a look real quick. So this actually is for anybody. So whomever would like to take it. This is from Avery Dawson. They say, how do people come to see themselves as leaders? Anyone can take this. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take a crack. I think one of the key things is, you know, professional athletes often talk about visualization, you know, seeing themselves, you know, in a, with, uh, in, in a successful outcome or producing some great feat. Uh, I, I think, you know, what has happened in the business world uh, is, has been that, you know, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we didn't have people of color in high positions within corporations or, you know, 
as entrepreneurs, et cetera. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think back when I started my career, um, there was a gentleman who happened to be uh, the CFO of the company that I worked for in the healthcare space. And he was just such an instrumental role model, you know, uh, in terms of showing me the ropes and others. And so I would just say, find those individuals uh, because, you know, uh, corporate America or entrepreneurial America now has people in every different, every discipline that look like us and, and, and find out who they are, learn their stories, you know, what are the keys to their success, but don't focus always on the success, but also, you know, uh, clearly understand some of their failures, right? Because most of the best leaders will be very upfront and clear about what those failures were and how that was uh, created a pivotal moment in terms of uh, which allowed them to change course and to try again and again. So I would just say, look around, uh, you know, whether it's with, uh, within our CAU family or, uh, or African-American community, there are many of people that you can look at that have uh, produced and are leaders, both men and women uh, mm -hmm. that are outstanding. And so we don't have that as an excuse because I know people say it's kind of hard to visualize something that you never see. Well, I think people do exist and we just have to make certain that we understand their stories, both successes and failures, and use that as a, a, our own personal motivation uh, to, uh, 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 to ascend to greatness that we're all destined for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Bree. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for anyone that would like to take it. Uh, this one is from alumnus David Carnegie. He says, how do you convince white men that D&L initiatives need their support? This is for anyone that would like to take the, the question. Was that, was that D and I or D and D and L? You talking about diversity and inclusion? Yeah, D and I. I'm so sorry. Yeah, diversity and okay. inclusion. I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. I mean, for me, you know, business is very, very personal, right? So this is this is a relationship oriented type of transaction in terms of we think about white business leadership and their ability to understand the value that we would create as being a part of the overall equation, right? Um, so to me, I focused on two things. Number one is just the value that I bring to the table, right? So, you know, questions around an internal view first before the external question of what do they see? What they need to see is the value that you bring to the table, right? So your skill set. Have you mastered your craft? How do you bring some perspective or some skills to solve problems, right? Mm -hmm. And then the relationship and the transaction and their perspective becomes less of a broader discussion from, you know, what DNI is all about, but you're on their radar and they can reach out to you specifically just to kind of crack open the door, right? And I would say mm -hmm. that right now the door is opening per se for more opportunities for either corporate leadership, corporate board opportunities, or you know people of color, right? There, there are there are. I would say that the the window is somewhat more open than it has been in years past, but it still comes down to your ability to be perceived as someone that can bring value to a situation. So you think about your personal brand, your skill set. And then your personal relationships, right, to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, right, to ultimately convey the value that you can bring to the table. Those are the things that kind of come into play when you think about being able to convince somebody that DNI is the right path or something that will, you know, be the right thing to do. It's not charity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are very, very serious business people with, you know, some challenging objectives, and goals to meet, right? And I think that the more that you can kind of weave yourself into how you fit into the solution for that, just so happens that you're African American and you have the relationships to parlay the right conversations, um, that that's tend to work for me. And um, you know, it seems as though today, nowadays, that 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 window is somewhat more open in it than it has been in the past, and and, it, and it's something that you know folks should take advantage of. Thank you so much. I'm just going to, and the other thing I would say with that, I, I, and I agree with everything what my brother just said, 
I'll tell you, I'll take a little bit cheesy approach to it too as well. When you start talking about getting that white guy to look at you, show them the profitability. What's the return on investment for doing it, right? right. At the end of the day, the green supersedes everything else. So if you right. show where we're going to move the needle profitably, then you got everybody's attention, white, blue, gray, black, green. I don't care what it is. At the yeah. end of the day, it's about the money. And so you can get on to, to all the reasons why we should do it and why. And what I've just realized at, at the time is that they're never going to understand what it feels like to be us. And, I mean, they're, they're not going to do it. The room is always white, so they're not ever thinking about it, right? But when we start talking about showing the numbers and show me the money, and you can show, hey, if we move this and tweak this and we got this segment of population, this is yeah. different because we implemented this strategy, you got all ears. That's just what I found is that you get all ears when you, when you can start talking about the profitability side. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much, alumnus Jackson and alumnus Kay. Thank you. Um, next question is from alumnus Devin White. He says, how do you define success? And this is for anyone that would like to answer. I can jump in. Um, I think success is different for everyone. Um, you, you think about it across different firms and across different brands. Someone may look at success as the number of things sold, sales, generated revenue. Someone else may look at, from a nonprofit standpoint, how many lives are impacted. I think as an individual, when you're at a, a corporation, um, you think about success, you, you need to think first internally. What does success look like, look like to you? How do you define yourself as a leader? And what are your ultimate goals? And sometimes it's not all about getting the next position or getting the next title. Maybe it's certain, certain areas you want to grow personally and professionally. Maybe it's learning, acquiring different skills. Maybe it's getting a different certificate. Maybe it's networking and growing your personal executive brand. I think when a person thinks about success, you can't compare your success next to someone else's because you, you're not on the same path. You're not parallel pathing here. So I think when you, you think about success and when you sit down and write down your own personal goals, um, what does success look like to you? Whether you want to become a leader or a people leader or whether you just want to grow within the company you work for, or you're setting down goals, whether it's every three, six and nine months, you think about quarterly goals or yearly goals. Um, I think first that internal reflection and then having that conversation, whether it's with a mentor or whether it's a coach or whether with a sponsor to help you achieve those goals and help you stay on track so that you can reach your own definition of success. Yeah, and, and, and I, like to add, I like to add on that. I think one of the failures I've seen in business is oftentimes people uh, develop the best strategies in the world, but at the end of the day, they, they do a poor job defining what's the successful outcome. And I think you have to always think about and define clearly what success looks like. Because I think that in itself serves as a great tool to motivate your team to make certain that everyone clearly understand why uh, it's an individual con contributor or a supporter or an outside vendor, whatever, knows what the bottom line looks like in terms of driving an outcome that everyone clearly understands. Because you know, even the best strategy sometimes, you know, leads to disastrous uh, uh, outcomes because they've been clearly defined uh, around what outcome uh, certainly is the one that the organization or the company is uh, seeking to produce. Okay. Thank you so much, alumna Melton and Trustee Reed. Uh, we did have uh, one more question. Well, two more questions, actually. I will definitely send those to you all after um, the webinar because we want to be uh, respectful of, of everyone's time and it is approximately 1.01 p.m. So we will be sure to um, get those questions answered uh, to the attendees that asked them and um, get those back to you, okay? So thank you all for all the questions. Please stay in contact with our alumni and look out for our upcoming webinars, which would take place every uh, Thursday, well, every other Thursday starting in November, rotating from noon to 1 p.m. and from 6 p.m. until 7 p.m. We have two more webinars left for the end of the year. So please be sure to tune in and to uh, support Great, thank you everyone. We appreciate you being here. Special thanks to my colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Mrs. Galen E. Gatewood Joshua, and to Dr. Rhodes for their stellar service, and to our panelists for a remarkable job today. And always a special thank you to our attendees for definitely joining us 
supporting us and for being here for us. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you all next week. Look out for more information regarding our webinar and alumni news by following us on social at CAU, Office of Alumni Relations. Catch us on Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter, or visit our website at www.cau.edu. Just click on the alumni tab at the right-hand corner of the site. Thank you so much and you all have a great weekend.